Good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to be here. I hope you're all having a fantastic day and making great progress on your pitches. Um, if I could ask one favor, if you are comfortable, it would be great to see folks uh, on camera if possible. Uh, no worries if not, but I really like to make this an interactive workshop as much as possible. So I'm not going to be presenting so much. I want to really be able to have a conversation with all and get you to feel comfortable. So thank you for joining this workshop. We're going to be navigating the future of technology, society, and innovation. And uh, I wanted to kick off with a bit of an interactive exercise, or at least just to get to know you a little bit better. So if you don't mind, I'm going to ask two very simple questions for you, if you can answer in chat. The first question is, where are you in the world? And the second is, use three words to describe yourself. And let's just get to know each other a little bit. And, uh, you know, I want you to get comfortable plugging stuff in chat. I'm going to be reading and listening. And uh, we'll be doing a pretty, I mean, I'll try to make as much time as possible for Q&A at the end of the session. So feel free to queue up any questions for after the presentation. But in the meantime, yeah, please do share anything you'd like to share. Where are you in the world? I'd like to know who I'm speaking to, whether what I'm saying is actually relevant. All right. Great faces. Thank you so much for turning on the cameras. All right, Miami, hardworking, innovative, committed. There you go, Edward. Love it. In the US, San Jose, ambitious, stubborn, impulsive. All right. That's an entrepreneur right there. <laughs> I love that cigar. Mm. Uh, anyone else want to share? Where are you at in the world? California, bored, ambitious, and confused. You know that boredom is the key to creativity. That is where creativity first begins is when you're bored. We're actually living in a world today where we're just disconnected so much from ourselves and on our smartphones in a time we're never bored. Argentina, California, beautiful. Australia, nice. Hey, Antoine. Whoa, okay. We got South Africa. We have a very international group here. Excellent. Okay. Uh, please keep sharing, and I'd, I'd love to continue to read this uh, probably afterwards, but I, I will get started with the presentation. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, so my name is Jeremy De La Rosa. I'm a father uh, to two young daughters that are seven and 10, a founder, an executive coach, advisor, writer, healer. I spent 20 years in the technology sector. I've operated in small startups all the way to large corporations. I've lived in three different countries, worked in about a couple dozen, and then traveled to about 40 different places, uh, many of which uh, you are all from. So really love where, all, where you all are from. Uh, I founded a nonprofit org uh, called Leyline, and our focus was to eradicate poverty using Web3 technology that eventually led to the creation of a DAO and a Web3 protocol that I launched. Uh, today, I'm actually working at the intersection of AI, Web3, health, and agriculture, and I'm a co-founder of a stealth startup that's leveraging AI and Web3 to help entrepreneurs. So that's a bit about me and the context around what I'm going to share with you today. So here's my vision. A world where humanity exists in symbiosis with benevolent AI, where we as a united species live in abundance, peace, and harmony with each other and Mother Nature. Now, I want you to take a moment and become aware of your reaction to that statement. Do you find yourself resisting this idea? Does it seem silly, naive, impossible? Why do you believe that? I am here to challenge that resistance and those old belief systems. So the first thing to do is take a situation assessment. Where do we stand today? We live in a time of great change and upheaval and transition. And the best way to understand this is by looking at bigger trends that are happening across the planet. The first set of categorical problems that we have on this planet start with environmental issues. We are experiencing ecosystem collapse in many different areas. Across the nine planetary boundaries that we need to sustain a healthy planet, we've already six, crossed six thresholds uh, of risk. One of the key elements of this is biodiversity loss, which is declining globally uh, for the past five decades. Uh, and is very concerning because it's tied to ecosystems of our food supply, our health, and underpinnings to our entire society. The second category of risks are with economic instability. Right now, the global debt to GDP is at unprecedented levels. Governments are basically spending more money than they have. And this is an issue because this eventually impacts your values and your assets, which are deflating or deflating over time. What you could buy for $1 today at McDonald's for a coffee, you could have gotten 30 Hershey's chocolate bars in 1913. 
Where is that money gone? The answer to that question is going to unravel many deep, deep hidden truths about how our society is not functioning well today. The other category is the political upheaval. Trust in institutions is declining across the board. NGOs, business, government, and media. We have rampant corruption and regulatory capture globally. This picture is a heat map of corruption indexes across the globe. And we see autocracies on the rise and failing of democracies. And ultimately what this means is that we are losing our individual freedom and sovereignty as a society. And the final category here are existential risks. So what we're experiencing now is a genesis and escalation of these kinds of risks. The rate of change in our technology is unprecedented and accelerating at an exponential rate. It's important to recognize that technology brings both creative destruction and new opportunity. It's a neutral tool that's not inherently good or evil. Of more concern though, is the human wielding that tool. What is their motivation? What's their intent? What decisions are they making based off their ethical framework? And is it for the greater good or not? So I share these things with you, not to depress you or dishearten you, and not to make you judge it for what it is, which are simply facts and truth. And the points that I wanna make are that, one, the systems that we put in place to manage the planet are no longer working for us. This is a part of a larger process in a cycle of change on earth. And for all the bad that might be there, there's also just as much good. So let's talk about the good. And we have to recognize that these problems need to be solved and the way to get there is through innovation. And there's no greater time for it. So some positive trends. Global poverty has been redu reduced dramatically over the past two to three decades, in large part thanks to economic growth in China and India. Life expectancy is rising. We're understanding medical science better. We're understanding health better. And in particular, we're stopping childhood mortality in developing nations. We see education rates climbing. More and more people are getting smarter and educated across the globe. And, everyone, and more and more people are getting connected to the internet. And so what this picture paints is we're having billions upon billions of people that are becoming safer, healthier, more educated and smarter, and connected, sharing knowledge and experiences. So this is a recipe for change. The world is ready for change. The market for innovators is massive, and technology enables us to in innovate at low cost. So if you're an entrepreneur or think about an entrepreneur, now is your time, and this is your call. So let's take a look at the economic, uh, the macroeconomic landscape that we're stepping into. Uh, this chart here is from ARK Invest. They mapped out the impact of innovation platforms across on economic activity over time. And you can see things, inventions like the steam engine, railroads, telephone, computers, and internet, and how it impacted the economy and society. The era we are stepping into has multiple foundational platforms for innovation. And all of these are integrated and correlating with each other and feeding into each other. Particularly, everything is be being boosted by AI. So this world that we're gonna be seeing in 10 years is currently unimaginable. It's gonna be completely different. But I'm gonna ask you to is use your imagination to envision your version of the future. So that's the macro scale, but how does it actually relate to your own work? I give full credit to Kai Fu Lee here with his magnificent TED talk, how humanity can save AI. And one thing he depicts is a spectrum across what tasks look like based on whether it's focused on optimization or creativity and strategy. And you can see here the categories of repetitive, routine, optimizing, complex, and creative tasks, and the type of roles that are associated with it. But there's another dimension to value creation and work, which is compassion. So if you look at this quadrant, you can now understand that there are different types of tasks and roles and skill sets needed. And what Kai actually highlights is what are the roles that we have that need compassion? Okay, yeah. So, is our economy currently valued? Right. Sometimes it's good, sometimes oh, bad. You need to mute. Thank you. Um, the question is, what is our currently, uh, what is our economy currently valuing, and what are the things that we value intrinsically as humans, and does that actually match? And this is an opportunity. And I think the most important message coming out of that is that we can coexist with AI. AI. There are different categories of work that are best suited for AI, which tends to, tends to be optimization and no compassion needed. There will be a, wor a world where there are tasks that are good for AI to automate, but need human assistance where the compassion is needed. When there's high creativity and high optimization, that's a blend between AI and humans. But ultimately where compassion and creativity is needed, that is where humans thrive and can get assistance from AI. 
So we have to really think about the new world that we're stepping into and the roles that we're going to be creating in this context. So if there are any skills that I would recommend focusing on in the AI-driven economy, it's this list here. First off, you need to be curious. You need to have an insatiable appetite to learn and to grow and to reflect on things and to take in information. And with that knowledge, your adaptability to change, to uh, respond to the shifting environment and shifting needs. Nothing that we see today is, is going to be static anymore. We're in this time of constant change and iteration. And so you have to mold yourself to that type of environment. And most importantly, you need to persevere because every time you change, you're running an experiment and experiments don't always succeed every single time. So every entrepreneur needs to think about running experiments, being okay with failure, taking learning from that and growing from that. And that is how you're gonna find your true calling and true path. Tied to this is mental clarity and expanded consciousness. Right now we're inundated with a lot of noise, whether it's social media, games, movies, Netflix, you name it. We're never really focusing in on our intuition and our inner voice. And the deeper thing is that we're not connected to our bodies and understanding how, how smart and intelligent they are. And even more importantly, we're not expanding our consciousness and connecting to others around us and to nature. And this is essential for you to make healthy decisions. And one pathway to get there is through writing and creative expression. The act of writing is a form of expressing your subconscious and all the hidden knowledge and wisdom that's in there. And how do you express that creatively, whether it's through music, art, writing, writing code, uh, any number of things are tied to your passions and your ability to express it. That is where true value is created. You also need to be emotionally intelligent. And emotions are not just this random set of feelings that are disconnected from logic and intuition. They're actually powerful guides that help you navigate life and help navigate relationships. And when you navigate that better, you're more enabled to give love and compassion both to yourself and to those around you. And that love and compassion allows you to connect, to connect the community, to people, and to earth. And that's why my vision here is that we're all going on this path towards connection community, a global community. So I ask you to rethink your relationship with work. Given all these facts, if technology can replace our old jobs, what does it mean to be of value? How do we quantify and exchange value in a way where human life, dignity, and the natural world are protected in the process? What systems do we need to make this happen? And how do we help people navigate this transition and change? So I'm gonna close with a few things here. One thing is what I believe that the world really needs right now. And I hope that is a call to action for you. And if any of these resonate to you, I'd be happy to chat and help you on your journey because this is vital to the prosperity of our species. So we need new microeconomies and abundance protocols. There's no reason that poverty needs to exist on this earth. It's solid system design. We need decentralized governance and cooperation systems to enable trust and transparency. We need open source and ethical frameworks for technology. We need decentralized and sustainable agriculture, waste removal and land renewal, clean and abundant energy, water purification, holistic healthcare, which is a complete integration of physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. We need new forms of education and not just talking about STEAM, but particularly with the arts and music and also adding in humanities, history, and philosophy. We need parenting or to invest in parenting because the root of all of society's ills actually are traced back to childhood trauma. We need better caretaking for the elderly and for the underserved, and better community building, and we need to continue investing in science and understanding truth. And most importantly, you are the leaders of tomorrow. The work that you do today is not only going to impact the billions of people that are alive today, but the quadrillions of people that are yet to be unborn. And the innovation that we need is that which is grounded in the heart. It is focused on truth, compassion, and connection, creating unity, opportunity, and abundance. So now we can just step into Q&A. Um, if you like anything I'm talking about here, I'm happy to connect. You can find me on my website, jeremy.love. I write weekly on Substack, meditations on AI, philosophy, family, love, and other big things, or you can connect on LinkedIn. Uh, but yeah, I hope this talk was uh, thought-provoking for you, and I'd love to hear any questions you might have. Feel free to pop it into chat or you can go hot mic and just start throwing things at me. What you got?
Yeah. I and think... if not, maybe I'll start with a prompt, but uh, I'll give another minute. Can you hear me? Uh, I, my question was, you talked a lot about uh, the philosophy behind artificial intelligence and your opinion and everything. I just had a question. Do you have any fear of the monopolization of artificial intelligence or what's your view on that? Uh, I would not say it's fear, but it's an understanding that there is risk involved in how we develop this stuff. And I suppose you could say it's good to have a healthy amount of fear. And the trends currently are not very promising. There is a pretty significant drive towards centralization of these technologies, obfuscation around the algorithms, um, consolidation of the power and control and governance, as well as the economic beneficiaries. Those are not good trends. And I do think that the revolution ahead of us is going to be through open source and decentralized movements. Um, unfortunately, it's difficult to be corruption resistant when all of the power and money is consolidated to one organization led by very few people that are decision makers. I do think the recipe towards that is going to be decentralized governance, decentralized decision making, community oriented development and segregation of power into smaller communities. Uh, that to me is how I think AI and technological development should proceed. It should lay a better foundation for transparency, trust, and collaboration. That's a great question. Thank you. All right, let's see. So Antoine says you're gonna present a project on key points. Sure, happy to give some feedback. I mean, we, we have our judges panel as well to do that too. Uh, and I agree with you, we do need a paradigm shift. In fact, many different paradigm shifts. Um, so what specific industries do you believe will be most affected by AI in a negative way? And what industries do you believe will be affected in a positive way? Uh, there are actually quite a few um, interesting research studies put out by different venture capital firms and governments. Uh, so I can't comprehensively say every single one, but I will say the nature of the specific industries that are gonna be impacted. And this does kind of come back to that quadrant that I showed around what are optimization tasks versus creative tasks. And the ones that are gonna be heavily disrupted are gonna be the ones that are routine and optimization focused, things that a machine can pick up very easily. These things are going to actually deprecate a lot of old jobs and roles, but it will require new jobs, new jobs to understand how to manage and control and maintain the systems that are now automating. Um, and then there's the other side of it, which is a creative piece. And, you know, I, I mentioned that, you know, we're connected now uh, as a species. I think there's probably six people, six billion people now connected to the Internet and that continue to grow. So you have to think about that in terms of market size and your audience out there is billions of people that you can now reach. And so what do you do to reach to them? It's actually your creative expression. It's your authentic expression of you. What are the things that are that excites you? What are the things that you're good at? What are the things that feel like play to you, but look like work to others? If you can find that and really hone in on that and express that, money will come to you. You will find a way, you will find an opportunity. It's really about embracing that inner strength and that inner unique value that you only you can really do. Um, I hope that answers your question I did in some way. It's not very specific to every single industry, but I am thinking in terms of thematics. And when you understand those fundamental thematics, then you can navigate your way into what to what to work in. Okay, Antoine. So don't you think that AI in the near future, especially the interface facilitating communication between human and machine as a chip in a brain that would augment a mental capability, kill the need for attending school and reshape education in general? What would be the point of learning about history, for example, if you have all history stored in a chip in your brain? I believe you don't know that you don't know about. You don't know what you don't know about. You can have access to the greatest library planet, which I'm currently building. It's a permanent web. Okay, nice. Stay with the Dow. Good job, Antoine. What would be the correct way to guide with the help of AI, a mind to explore a library of unlimited knowledge? Ooh, this is a big, big question. And it does speak to consciousness and it does speak to knowledge and whether or not all knowledge is actually required in order to be functional or to be happy. And yes, theoretically, implanting a trip, chip in your brain could feed you a lot of specific information, 
The question is what information is actually relevant to what you need to do and act on it. And is an overstimulation of that knowledge actually necessary or even good for you? So the amount of knowledge in the universe is incalculable. It's gargantuan. It's so big that we can't even fit into our brains. We have to make heuristics and shortcuts to conceptualize what is actually out there. So our brains have very limited capacity. And even a, a semiconductor and a chip is going to have limited capacity. You can't understand the truth of the universe. So if you cannot have infinite knowledge, what is more useful is practical and relevant knowledge. So to me, I think that can happen in a number of ways. It can happen through human connection, through cooperation. And if you, if you look at the way that nature functions, for example, it's completely decentralized. There is no like one tree leader that decides this is how the planet functions. Like there's different forests, there's different fungal kingdoms, there's different uh, predators that are eating stuff and balancing it out. And they don't need to know how the whole world functions, but it, yet nature just thrives anywhere it is. Um, this is not this is a very deep question. So I'm curious, uh, Antoine, if you're willing to go into discussion about this, does that help answer your a uh, little bit of a question, or am I touching on it correctly? <laughs> Thank you. I, I love this question. Um, you know, I, I have to admit that early on, maybe four or five years ago, I was full on with Elon Musk's Neuralink. I was like, yes, I totally want in, sign me up, not going to do the beta, but maybe like, you know, stage one or stage two afterwards. Uh, but now that I've actually spent more time meditating, connecting to a larger consciousness that's out there, I realized that one, there's incredible danger of implanting a chip into your mind. If you look at all of our IT systems today, they are deeply, deeply insecure and fragile. A hacker can come in, there's social engineering, there's all this terrible stuff. We're very flawed in how we create software. Do you really want a chip in your brain that could short circuit, that someone can hack, that some government or some kind of corporation can control? It's a very risky endeavor. And to achieve what? And if the if it's about achieving you know, deeper awareness and knowledge, I think there are other paths to get there. Um, that's my current uh, journey that I'm on right now. And uh, my hypothesis is that there is a greater collective consciousness that we're all connected to, where that all that knowledge is accessible whenever you need it, and you just access it whenever you need it, and you just apply it. Um, but yeah, I tried to accumulate so much knowledge, and I realized how, how futile an endeavor that is to... Um, fully know everything because it's just so much bigger than a brain can actually process. Uh, did I ask it a question? Come to the chip in mind. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's it is worth the experiment. You know, I, I think uh there there's there's great the danger and risk. If I can imagine a the safest possible way that this could work, I do think it would need to be fully firewalled. They would not be able to, uh, you would not want to have any kind of external inputs into it outside of what you give explicit permission to. Um, it would need to have like its own recursive learning too, just in case like it does something very damaging to you. Like that's that, I mean, and you can only know that through experimentation. So people are going to have some very bad experiences, uh, unfortunately, as part of this process. Uh, so yeah, I, and right now, opting not to sign up for something like that. <laughs> but we'll see what the future holds, you know? I I don't have uh, deep convictions about it. Uh, okay, Sagar, thank you. Speaking of developing technologies being quite dangerous, including AI use in government and human use, how do you feel about the current security measures being taken for protection? Um, my honest assessment is I think there is still a lot of work to be done. And the dangers of how things are being approached now is who is making the decisions. And if you, if you want to know the truth, follow the money. Follow the money. Which politicians are getting funded by which corporations and large donors? Who are those people and what are their motivations? If their motivations are not like for the greater good and for the prosperity of the individual people, hold it suspect. I'm not saying that it's guaranteed to, be, guaranteed to be some kind of sinister detrimental decision, but you can see that there's going to be a conflict of interest. Um, I think that's the best way to navigate this world is using your intuition and your trust and inspecting where people's underlying motivators are coming from.
So lots of work needed here. And honestly, we need your help. We need your help to step into the space <laughs> and like start challenging the status quo and introducing new ideas and changing and saying, no, I call BS on this. This is not okay. Uh, okay, Tresta, as we see the growing relevance of AI in our daily life today, I had an inquiry regarding a topic you touched on. Though given its dependency on automation, what do you think the software itself faces as notable setbacks that might challenge its potency? For example, affecting its accuracy of answers or unbiased feedback, especially since most are trained models. Yeah, you know, I think one analogy that I use to look at AI is a child. And you can look at an infant, you can look at a toddler, a young adult, a teenager, even us as adults, we're still growing and learning. So thinking that any tool we create is gonna be immediately infallible is probably some flawed thinking. I think we have to understand that in itself, it is a baby. It is learning things. It is taking in new inputs. It's making interpretations. It's making experimentations. So just like you wouldn't trust a baby to drive a car, you want to give it a chance to like test out certain things, but always hold it with some skepticism with your own judgment and then understand are the outputs of the action matching to, to your reality? Is there coherence in what you're experiencing, what you're seeing? And I don't think that this may ever become perfect. It's, it's possible that AI will be a supreme intelligence, but at least in this transitionary state, this is a symbiosis. We want to be working together with it. AI is only going to get smarter by hearing us and listening to us, and we feed it its data. It's learning from us. We are its parents. We're teaching it. So I think a, a lot of how we navigate this current space is really through experimentation. It's by not inherently trusting that this is going to be a perfect output, taking it for it what valuable what value it does give and refining it with your own judgment. I think that is the way that we work with AI symbiotically. Cool. Thank you, Shrestha. All right. Any other questions? or thoughts or comments or feedback. Okay, then I can give you just one last prompt before we go and you can just plug this into chat. If there was one thing that came out of this talk, discussion, presentation that resonated with you, what was that one thing? Feel free, just plug away. All right. <laughs> A lot at fun. Okay, great. That's good news. <clears throat> okay. No other takeaways. I'm surprised. Incredible. All right. We're going to have to do better next time. Okay, Aditya. AI will help make interactions more accessible. Totally agree. I totally agree. There are tremendous benefits that are going to come to humanity and to Mother Mother Earth, thanks to AI, just as much as there is risk for that too. So we have to manage the risks and exploit the benefits. That's really how we want to position ourselves here. AI is a double-sided double -sided sword indeed. AI does have some problems, uh, but just as many opportunities, if not more opportunities. Definitely core problems, more opportunities. And as entrepreneurs, you want to focus on a problem so you can solve them, but think about solutions. And if there's one thing I could share with you, approach any situation with that, which is not so much, here's a problem. It makes me feel like, ugh, whatever. Look at the problem, identify it as truth, and then now start thinking about creative solutions. That's the best way for you to navigate life as an entrepreneur. Great potential for AI. Yes, absolutely. AI is revolutionizing, but it's important to acknowledge how exactly this happens and how we can go about working around it in the economy today. I like it. Love that, Tresta. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, everybody. Uh, I appreciate you interacting and chatting. Again, I wish you all the best of luck in uh, the pitch competition. I'm really looking forward to seeing all the ideas that come through. And feel free to connect if uh, anything resonated here and if I could be of help. Thank you, everybody. Take